Welcome back. Hey, there's Elvin. Trickling in. How was Labor Day? <clears throat> down the road. And I need to change the schedules. I completely forgot. Exactly. It's after fall. I confirmed it's right after fall break. So um, it's still down the road, but just to plant a seed in your head. Um, yeah, after fall break, we come back on Tuesday because we have that Monday off. Uh, but that Tuesday, everyone pretends that it's Monday. We all play Monday. Um, I don't know. It's weird. I'll remind you down the road. But thanks for the, for the check thinking I was maybe in the wrong place this morning, but whew, we're not. So today uh, we're going to start a little bit differently. Um, instead of diving right in um, the actual, like, I think it's still class stuff. Uh, we're going to start with the face your fear stuff that we were on uh, last time, kind of picking up where we left off. What do you think of the exorcism stuff, by the way? Interesting. You're like, well, yes, <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> Did anyone learn anything? about exorcism, but you go home and tell your family, hey, there's a, if we need one, it turns out we're not out of luck. It can still happen. Um, so yeah, it's always fun talking about that. Um, trying to cram a first year seminar's worth of material into 60 minutes is a bit of a challenge. Um, so if that did, if that's something you're interested in and you'd actually like to know more, um, one of you already asked me, um, yeah, I'll sit down and I could talk to you for hours about, there's a lot, there's a lot more stuff. Um, but I hope you enjoyed that. And someone, someone had asked just to get it. I don't think I ever actually said this out loud. So that's my fault. Um, the idea was to have the reflection in by Sunday at midnight, but if you didn't, that's okay. Just do it as, as soon as you can. Um, that's kind of how, I think I mentioned this the very first day. I just haven't really emphasized it since. Um, like in my brain, when we have stuff for a week, um, and I'll, I'll show this to you in a second. Um, if, if, like, if something's assigned on Thursday, in my brain, it's due Sunday at midnight. It's, it's, that's when the week ends. So, but if you didn't get it in yet, don't worry. You're not going like, to lose points or anything like that. Just get it in as soon as you can. And I, in fact, I know I didn't say that out loud because we were transitioning into this stuff. So week three, um, deal with the monks will actually make a lot more sense before you get out of here today. Um, we will, we'll start chapter three today at some point. Um, I'm not going to rush the face of your stuff because that's important. Today is especially important as we start making our way um, towards the goal of Cedar Point. Mariah Carey was there yesterday, right? You see that on the news? I don't know why, but Mariah Carey was at Cedar Point with her entourage yesterday. She had a ball. Um, so what's, what's on tap? Um, today you're really going to learn... Uh, I keep hinting at the idea that mindful meditation 
um, is more than just sitting and breathing, that there's actual science behind it and what it can actually do to the inside of your brain. We're going to take a really deep dive into that today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about phobias and where they come from, um, talk a little bit about the different types of anxiety to get things rolling. Um, and then uh, how I'm going to do this, because uh, I know we all go in 18 different directions all the time, we're probably going to stop today um, around 10.45, I'm going to remind myself. And the reason we're doing that is so I can uh, have an initial talk with all of the people that are on the writer side of this whole thing. Um, so supporters, you're off the hook today. Um, don't worry, uh, there's other stuff for you to do. Um, and in fact, everybody has something to do, and that is every once in a while, I'll always remind you when I put it up here, if you go to the content, I don't think this was visible up until about 45 minutes ago. So um, you'll, you'll see this thing pop up. It's there for all of you. They're called the Face Your Fear readings. Um, there's a few additional things uh, to go over as we make our way to the Face Your Fear project. And the first two are actually up there. And this is for everybody, whether you're on the writer side or the supporter side. Um, these are brief. This isn't like a textbook that you're opening up. Um, these are actually wonderfully scanned copies um, of a workbook that I actually use um, in my private practice with clients that come in with phobias and anxiety disorders. And I actually go over this with them. Um, and send this home with them, and they read it, and they come back. Um, this is all part of that psychoeducation piece. Remember the five pieces of the Face Your Fear project? Um, in fact, uh, part of what you're going to read is a snippet of what I read. Uh, I mean, same stuff. It hasn't changed 20 years ago when my eyes were opened, and I finally had an explanation for what was going on for me. So um, there's one called, you're seeing more, because you're seeing what I see. So there's, there's not all this is visible to you. Uh, but the two on tap for this week, and we're going to be going over it, by the way. Um, so you'll hear it come out of my mouth, and you'll write it down. And then when you read it, like, oh, yeah, that's what we talked about in class. So it'll all make sense. Um, anxiety and Phobias 101 just kind of introduces the different types of anxiety. It turns out there is actually more than one. Um, and it also goes through phobias uh, in a pre pretty good detail, which also, by the way, if you're really interested, um, gets talked about in Chapter 6 as well. So... We're also making headway. When we get to chapter six, a whole chunk of it we'll be able to skip over because we've already done it. Um, a lot of this stuff comes from there. And because chapter six is called the anxiety disorder. So hint, hint. Uh, more to, and then another one called causal factors. One thing that we'll talk today about is, okay, well, where does this come from? Like, why me? That question that I asked when I was 13 years old, being the schmuck uh, who couldn't get on Magnum, why? I, I, that question plagued me for years. Why is this affecting me? Why can't I get on it? Why can I write this and not that? Oh, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, well, I found my answer. It took me two decades, but I finally solved the mystery. So maybe if you're going through something, you can solve your mystery a little bit quicker because I didn't have the opportunity to take a class like this and learn. Let me show you what this looks like. Um, see, I told you they're beautifully scanned. Um, <clears throat> Read, read, read. It's not that long. At some point, you'll see I wrote stop because you're supposed to stop. There you go. Stop. Smiley face. So you don't need to do that. So it's literally just about introducing anxiety and phobias and then stop where it says. I mean, you can keep going if you want to, but you don't have to. Oh, let's see. Any questions? No? Okay. Awesome. No questions. Um, Let's see, let's just talk briefly about where we've been. You should have this. So this is just like pre-review. Um, we also have our first quiz next Tuesday. So it's on the schedule, uh, but just so everyone just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so since we have a quiz next Tuesday, what will be on it? Because everyone will keep asking me, like, what's going to be on it? Do you remember? Anna, no. Starting now. So we always I always try to have them on Tuesdays because the quiz, which will it would, it would be happening right now. If it's a quiz that you'd be writing down the answers to all the questions. Um, the quizzes will always go over the previous two classes. So it's nice that they're on Tuesday because you can just say, all right, so that last week's stuff. So starting now is potential stuff for the quiz. Um, but let's, do you, do you guys remember this? Let's see how much, how smart you are, how smart you become. What are the three differences between fear and anxiety? We did this last week. You can just shout them out. I know, I can see you. you're all wanting to shout. 
I know. We just came back from Labor Day. I'm exhausted. You're exhausted. We'll be exhausted together. We should have coffee machines in all the groups. Suspense. Remember, Haley? What's one that came to your hands? I one is that fear lives in the present, so the spider's right here in front of me. Anxiety lives in the future. I'm worried about what that spider might do. But it hasn't happened. You're just you're just worried about it. So that drives your anxiety. What else? Yeah. Exactly. So fear, and I know we haven't gotten specific on what's exactly flowing through your body, but we will in the coming weeks. Um, fear is like an intense rush of chemical changes inside your body that makes you feel that fight or flight like that's what that's what that is and anxiety same stuff same chemicals it's just happening in the background constantly if you well I, my I car our car died <laughs> one of our cars died over the weekend why um, it's currently at the doctor I took it in this morning um, and it's been bugging me it's been bugging me for four days it's driving my little kid home for cross-country practice, nothing, nothing worried about, and all of a sudden, it just, it just stopped. It just stopped working. Um, and a little message came up saying, "Oh shit!" That's what it said. It's like, "Take, take me to a mechanic." So, so right now, I've got a slow drip of the same fear stuff happening in the back of my mind because I don't have a good, I got a bad feeling about this. I don't think it's gonna end well. But what's the third one? Yes. Um, this bond one. Exactly. So. Fear, you just, you escape, right? You escape and you feel better. Anxiety, you avoid. Uh, so when the car place leaves a message, I'm not gonna listen to it for a while because I don't wanna hear the bad news. I'm just gonna avoid it, um, let my wife answer it. Um, and she can she can let me know what happens. So no, I won't do that. So anyway, it's all right. you guys are, you already know more about anxiety than half the population of the United States. Well, we haven't gotten into yet. Uh, well, let me, let me jump here. The prefrontal cortex we haven't gotten to yet. What's weird about the amygdala? I know we went over this. Not weird, but tell me about the tell me about the amygdala. Like what is it? How is this related to anxiety and fear? Yes. Exactly. It can, which is the cool thing about mindful meditation. Did anyone try that, by the way? How'd it go? Great. It went great. Yeah. I meditate somewhat regularly, so it wasn't. Okay. Really yeah, I love it. You love it? Someone else should be. How'd it go for you? It was fine. I fell asleep, so. Good. Well, you know, this is actually a good thing. So a lot of people in this class who don't suffer from any type of anxiety whatsoever, um, we're going to, obviously, mindful meditation is going to be a big part of this. There's two things. So just keep this in mind. There's two things that I hear from a lot of students. The first thing is it helped them sleep better. Not right away. Uh, but after a few weeks of practicing it, they're like, yeah, it's weird. Um, I used to be one of those people where, you know, not terribly long, but it would take me a half hour, 40 minutes to fall asleep. It's like now I can just lay down and just, I'm out. Like, it's great. I can, if I want to shut myself off, I can shut myself up. And the other thing is, is great. It's study. People's concentration goes up. Their focus goes up. And they feel like, I feel like I'm doing better in all my classes. So this isn't just lip service. I'm not just tossing it out there. This is a very consistent finding um, from the people on, on both sides, the anxiety side, the support side. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And before you walk out of here today, I think you'll understand why, like this is the research that's behind this. So the amygdala, she's exactly right. And the reason it might be maybe oversized and maybe oversensitive in people that deal with anxiety is because they use it more, right? If you use a part of your brain more, it gets bigger, it gets stronger. Um, in other parts, not so much. Um, I guess you could drop this down for now, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back up later in about a half hour, 40 minutes. I guess the, the answer to your amygdala, right, the answer to this is in your prefrontal cortex, which is exactly where it sounds like it is. It's right in the front of your brain. In fact, it's the tip of your brain. Incidentally, it's also the last part of your brain to develop, mature. But the prefrontal cortex holds the brakes, the braking system. When you are anxious, when you're worried, when you feel any negative emotion like stress or hatred, Jealousy, rage, Haley's full of rage right now. Whenever you calm yourself down, it's your frontal lobe. Your prefrontal cortex is where your braking system is. This is also where you feel positive emotions. This is where they start, like empathy and compassion. 
Lucas is full of it. He exudes compassion and empathy. No, seriously, this is... And the interesting thing about mindful meditation is, as the amygdala gets weaker, the prefrontal cortex, your braking system, actually gets stronger. That part actually grows. You actually see gray matter growth inside your brain. Have more on that to come. Before we get to this thing that ingredients to a phobia, sorry, I'm going to steer at this PowerPoint for like 10 more minutes. I should have planned this better. Um, over there, and this is actually from your reading, um, there's three different types of anxiety. Maybe you feel all of them at the same time, but probably not. There's actually three very specific types of anxiety that a human being experiences. And there's nothing wrong with this, by the way. If feeling anxious is part of being a person. It's just that when it gets strong enough that it causes problems, all right, well, now maybe we need to do something about it. So the first type of anxiety, and I just literally jotted that down so I could remember to say this out loud. I keep putting this room in tables so that I can actually walk over there and write so it's not awkward. <laughs> like, where, well, but they keep moving it back to this. I don't know why. So in about an hour, I will once again make tables for my class later today, and I'll come back. The elves come at night, and they put it back in the rooms. It's like this big game we keep playing. So the first type of anxiety is called free-floating anxiety. Again, when you do you do those readings, this is one of the first things you'll read about. Okay, there you go. This is get the head to the stop sign. Free-floating anxiety is anxiety that you feel with no particular target whatsoever. What? What does that mean? Have you ever just felt on edge and you can't really? If someone asks you, like, what's going on? Like, I don't know. Just go. Oh. I just feel, yeah, that's that's called free-floating anxiety. You might be a little more irritable. You might just be, like, more susceptible to, like, loud noises or, like, really. This is called free-floating anxiety. When there's, you can't really explain it, you just feel on edge. Like, I don't know what's going on. It could be caused by stressors in your life, whatever it is. But, yeah, you can't pin it down. You're not nervous about something you have to do. You're just... You just feel anxious and heat up. And this can last, well, fill in the blanks. The second type of anxiety, you've all done this, that is called anticipatory anxiety. The scientific name for what we call worry. <laughs> that's all anticipatory anxiety is. There's something in your life that's... That's what's driving your anxiety. If we had you underneath that MRI machine, we'd see your amygdala humming. Even though there's nothing around you, nothing happening, you're just, you're anticipating bad news from the mechanic. And then the third type, which is related to phobias, which is where we're going to make this segue, is called situational anxiety. Situational anxiety is when you're in a certain situation... You're at the airport, you have an airplane phobia, you're in a certain situation that's connected to a very specific fear or worry of yours. So you're actually in, now you're in the situation, you're worried about all the what ifs. Well, what's going to happen? How long is it going to take for the wing to fall off? When will the explosion happen in midair? Right, your brain starts going through all the catastrophes. Yes. Anticipatory anxiety. And that's that's literally one word definition. That's just worry. You're not necessarily in the situation. You've got an exam a week from now and you're already worried about it. Sorry. So free floating, you're just keyed up. Anticipatory, you're worried about something specific, but it's out there. And situational, you're actually there. Now you're it's you're in the classroom, ready to take the exam, and as you're taking it, you're you're worried. I'm I'm not smart. Yes, you are. You're a reader. Funny, we I've come full circle. So I'm from Defiance, Ohio, and who did Mount Union play this weekend? I I, I could I looked at this. I'm like, oh damn it! I, I knew it was going to happen because 
Defiance College. There's actually a college in Defiance called Defiance College. Um, so yeah, maybe it wasn't pretty. One of those over by the first quarter. Like, I just shut it off. But anyway, go oh, Defiance, yay! Um, anyway, like, lambs to the slaughter. Let's talk, finally, let's talk about this. So, phobias. It's more than just intense fear. I wish I could you more of the syrup. Sorry. Actually, this is kind of fun. We're technically talking about our first diagnosis in this class. So, what is a phobia all about? That will give its official title, the official diagnosis. And by the way, not everyone that has a phobia goes to a therapist and gets diagnosed. Like that's right. No, not everyone does that. But if you did, you would get diagnosed. So the guy that I'm working with with an airplane phobia, his diagnosis is specific phobia. That's that's what it's called, specific phobia. It is uh, a couple things about it. We'll revisit this again in chapter six, but it's it's actually the most commonly diagnosed anxiety disorder there is. So not only does the Face Your Fear Project tackle the most commonly diagnosed category, which is anxiety disorders, it actually attacks the, the most common of the anxiety disorders, which is a specific phobia. A lot of people have a phobia. Some of them make sense, some of them don't make any sense. So what is it? There's actually three, you're looking through the symptoms, all right, DSM, phobia. What are the three symptoms of a phobia? Any ideas? Well, let's get the first. The first one's the obvious one. Intense fear about something. Fill in the blank. So the first one is intense fear about, and literally you could draw a line because we'll cover what could be in that line. Now there's a little bit more to this. Strong enough. So intense fear that's strong enough to induce something that we call panic. Panic is more than just, I feel afraid. Panic is what I described to you in my stories about being six years old and having those psychological and physical symptoms. And it's also what happened to me while taking case notes in Mount, Mount Hall. Yeah. So panic is panic is the most extreme form of anxiety, right? We, we go from, I'm just worried, I'm kind of worried about something, to you're having physical, psychological, and biological reaction. Um, someone already mentioned, um, well, actually, I won't pick on someone here. Mary, remember Mary, the road, top thrill dragster, and then she cried and said, I never forget, in, in this this time, we, we, when we were first talking about goals and what to do, she would literally start shaking. Like she would start shaking just thinking about six weeks from now, we're going to be going to Cedar Point. She, that's, how, that's how big the reaction was. And that's what would happen to her when she was in line. She wasn't joking. The, the furthest she ever made it in line was about a quarter of the way through. And she would have to bail because she would throw up. She would start having a full-blown panic attack. She, I think she tried seven or eight times to get on that damn thing. And that's why she said on that video, she's like, well, I guess my goal is just to make it further in line. She wasn't joking, because she thought that's all she'd be able to do. Um, so number one, intense fear, strong enough to induce panic. That, that people kind of usually stop there. Well, that's a phobia, right? You're just really scared of something. Well, symptom number two helps unravel a little bit. Symptom number two is this fear from number one is irrational. There's a rationality piece. A little bit more to this. The, the person, the subject, whoever we're talking about, may or may not be aware of this irrationality. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But Objectively, the point to number two is this fear is irrational. And I always go back, well, I mean, we could pick on roller coasters and rides if we wanted to, but airplanes, let's just take it away from the amusement parks for a second. Does having an airplane phobia make any sense? No, not, no, it doesn't. It's completely irrational. And you've all heard, 
how helpful would it be if I gave my client uh, the pamphlet that says, well, you know, John, you're safer up in the air than you were driving to the airport. You're 37 times more likely to get in an accident on your way. And no, that, that shit doesn't help. And because he already knows that. He, he knows. I knew when I was 13 that my stupid phobia of magnum made no sense. And guess what? That made it worse. My knowledge of knowing this didn't make sense made me feel terrible about myself. So it's irrational, and the person is often aware, Obje objectively, if they can look back, yes, I realize my airplane phobia makes no sense, but that makes it worse, because then they know, well, damn it, there's something wrong with me. Great. Fantastic. So irrationality is a big part of it. And number three, number three is a big component, too. The person goes to great lengths, often goes to great lengths to avoid putting themselves into this situation, whatever it is. And I told you about all the lies that I would tell. The client that I work with, with the airplane phobia. The reason he was there, because he was older, he's in his 60s. The only reason he was doing this now in his life was because there was like a once in a lifetime vacation coming up. Um, his family, he had grandkids now. And he's getting older, other people in the family are getting older. They're all taking this huge once-in-a-lifetime vacation to some place off the Bahamas. And the only way to get there is to fly. There, there was no, there's no boat option, or I'm sure he would have taken it. He probably canoe himself. With all that. Um, and so this is it. He's, and he's either going to miss this vacation and sit home because of his phobia um, or finally get over it. And he told me, and I mean, I believe him. I don't know why he would make this stuff up. He had, a, he had an invitation to USC, to not that he was going to get the scholarship, but he was a good running back for Canton. He played for Canton McKinley years ago, um, and he actually missed. He, he, he went to some of them. Uh, he played college somewhere, uh, but he, he had a flight out to USC like when he was like 18 years old, and he didn't take it. He never got the interview to go out there because of his airplane phobia. He's like, I've missed. He's missed so many things in his life because of this. Um, so number three, you go to great lengths to avoid it. And those are the major ingredients. Fear, it's irrational, which doesn't help. And then you go to great lengths to avoid it. And this is kind of the threshold, like between, okay, is it, a, is it a phobia that we can deal with, or is it just I'm really scared? Airplanes make me feel really uncomfortable. Like, I just, I don't like it, but I'll do it. I've never in my life tried to get out of it. Um, and then once we're, like, up in the air, I'm like, oh, this is fine. Right, I just, but it's it's just my anxious brain. It's still there, um, so I don't have an airplane phobia. So if you're scared of something, but you'll still do it, uh, and this was kind of the difference for a lot of you between being on the support side and the writer side. Some people said, well, like, well, I'm sure as hell be scared, but I would do it. Okay, well then, if you would do it, then what's the point? Then we're not really doing anything. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, so you got it. So ingredients to a phobia. Um, there's also and then we'll switch gears. There's five categories. You're probably wondering, I know. I see your seat. Dr. Martin, what does that mean? There's five major categories of phobias. So if you've ever had one, you can see where you would fall. Any guesses of what these might be? I don't know why I'm, my 10 year old's in cheer. So. Intense game. It's funny. I go to these like they call, they call it little leopards in Louisville, like the fifth and sixth graders playing football. It's hilarious. Um, they they rarely throw the ball because that always ends in a disaster. Um, so there's just like a bunch of running. But it's funny. You get into this like I, I found myself like yes, like cheering for the well, number ninety nine. Hey, he's got a daughter. I'm just there to watch my daughter. I don't know why I'm telling you this. Categories: Lucas, any any guesses? No. What are people freaked out about? What are people have phobias of? Okay, that's, we'll start there. There's no really amazing place to start. He said heights. Heights fits into a category that we call situational. I'll get the ball rolling. So we got situational. That means you find yourself in a particular, you're in an elevator, you're in a roller coaster, airplanes. So that's all, that would all be rolled into that. 
Another one is called natural environment. Storms, the dark. A third one is animals. Spiders, maybe it's dogs. Remember little Albert when he took Psych 110S? They induced a phobia, remember, in little Albert of little white animals. <laughs> Poor guy. So it could be animals. A fourth one is actually the most common. What would be the most, what do you think? And people avoid something that they should not avoid for long stretches of time because of this. That's a good one, but that would actually be situational. But you're so just just to highlight that. So social interaction, because you, the reason that's situational is you would be like that makes sense. So, but that's that's in fact that is so common. It has its own diagnosis, separate from specific phobia. We have something we'll talk about it called social phobia. Yeah, oh. it's definitely related to health. So we give it we give it a weird name. It's called blood injection and injury. B I I. I don't know who picked that name because maybe what Anna said is, is it Anna or Tom? You never know. It'd be funny if you would have said, like, it's actually a name. <laughs> anyway, blood injection injury. And this has to do with anything medical shots, seeing blood, especially your own blood, going through any type of medical procedure. So, blood injection injury. Some people just have. Technically, the dentist. If you if you if you fear the dentist going there, you're not scared of the dentist. Like, oh my God, it's Doctor Paris. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, you're scared of what's going to happen in your mouth, right? Is it going to hurt? Is it? So that that would fall under this category. And then we have my favorite one, the fifth category, and this explains why phobias can be so vague. We just call it other. In other words, phobias can take. You can literally develop a phobia of almost anything because it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. I once helped a lady who was had a phobia of making phone calls. She would answer the phone. She could talk on the phone. She could text. But she, I, and I know, and it doesn't make, and she was scared to even say anything because she was afraid of the reaction that I would have. Like, oh, I've heard it all, lady. I'm probably not, but... There's no judgment here. I, I get it. It's she, but she could not. Anyone ever experienced this? I've actually had more than one student say, yes, my mom. She will not. Huh. Yeah, she, so she made everyone else, and her, her husband was like, please change my wife, because he had to make every phone call for everything that they ever did. Like, imagine being that person, like, all the time. You always have to make, because she had a phobia. But not anymore. Um, anyway, any questions? Because we're going to switch gears a little bit. I mean, we're still on phobias, but you at least get to stare at a different picture. Okay, so let's start to unpack a little bit amusement park rides and roller coasters specifically, but also that big swing called Skyhawk. What's this all about? So if you're on the rider list, there's maybe one or two or all three of these happening in synchrony. There isn't an actual phobia called roller coaster phobia, although I'm we're making that up. <laughs> right, because they always have these weird names, like, oh yes, techophobia, the fear of text. What is acrophobia? For for a lot of you, this is it. This is this is this is why you won't ride the thing. Any ideas what this might be? It's not. That's I don't know what that's called. Invertophobia. <laughs> yeah. This is yes. Acrophobia is the technical term for fear of heights. So for a lot of people, it's well, I'll write this, but no way because that's way up there. No, not not fear of heights. So acrophobia. So maybe that's it, or maybe it's part of it. It's what's not the fear of tax. What is tachophobia? 
so people listen to it. Yeti is what a tachometer is. There we go. So this is a this is a fear of intense speed. I like this one because it goes 20 miles per hour. I do not like that one because it goes 98 miles per hour. So tachophobia is a fear of intense speed, and traumatophobia is just maybe exactly what it sounds like. A phobia that something horrific is going to happen to you if you do this. But the reason I put safety in there, it's sort of a common denominator that drives almost every phobia. I should have had two words up here, safety and control. For whatever reason, you've convinced yourself that this is not safe. Yes, I know you've told me it's safe. I just don't believe you. The airplane, I, I've read the pamphlet. I know it's safe. I just don't believe it myself. That's weird, right? That's a weird reality to live in. You know it's true, but you don't believe it. At least you can't bring yourself to believe it. And the other, which isn't up there, sorry, I thought it was, control. A lot of this is about you just you don't like things when you're not in control. And what more profound situation could you not be in control in than you being strapped into something that's going to go 90 miles per hour and the person pushing the button is an 18-year-old working a part-time job. Have fun. Right? You feel it's not safe. You'll learn eventually more than you ever wanted to learn about amusement park rides and why they're safe. But anyway, that's like two weeks from now. But that's that's really what drives it. You don't feel safe? Sure it's safe. No, it's not. Your mind, your mind tricks you. And then we get to this. And this is the, the this is what we're going to do over the next six weeks it is inherently difficult. There is a trickiness to amusement park fears and phobias that doesn't apply to anything I've ever done with a client. And just off the top of my head, airplanes, elevators, talking on the phone. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh at her. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking it. Oh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> And again, that was the weirdest part was the phone rang. She's fine. It's like initiating the conversation, but not in real life. She'll talk to you. Just not on the phone. You know how we started, by the way? We did kind of like a baby style. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but we started by, okay, you call, call me. I'm sitting here. That's how, that was the first step. And then we went from there. Like, now I'll leave the room. Now you call me on with anyway. What's, what, would, what would be tricky, inherently tricky about this? which makes it different. It's still successful, just tricky. Any ideas? Yes. Is it the, the waiting and the build-up of getting oh, that, You story? know, that does. I hadn't really, that, that's a good observation. I'm glad you're thinking about that. We'll, we'll talk about that. You're right. Um, yeah, when you, when you get on an airplane, they don't make you like, wait in a queue line. <laughs> Stare at it for an hour and a half. But that's true. Are airplanes designed to look frightening? Like, do they like paint like <laughs> damage? <laughs> like, that's not like, oh my god! I'm like, no, it's just part of the act. <laughs> of course not. Like, no, airplanes are boring. They they look like big metal tubes that just go up in the air. Cedar Point, especially, and other amusement parks. If you hadn't noticed. Manufacturers of rides will go out of their way, literally go out of their way and spend an insane amount of time trying to figure out of how can we design this so it looks terrifying. I call this the parlor tricks. In fact, we'll spend a whole hour eventually, like uh, next week or two weeks, talking about all the different parlor tricks they play on you. When you walk into Cedar Point, yes, they want you to have fun. Of course they want you to have fun. But part of the art of designing roller coasters is making it look unsafe. They want to induce that in you because that's the fun, especially for people who aren't scared of roller coasters, who will ride anything. Okay, what's left? Okay, well, what can we do to make this seem unsafe? Wouldn't that be a fun conversation to have? 
And they do. They and well, so a lot of it, a lot of what drives people fear is an illusion. It's like walking into a a magic act. But then um, we'll, what we're going to do eventually is we'll kind of we'll, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Lift the veil. Yeah, you'll you'll learn what they do and the parlor tricks, and hopefully it doesn't suck the fun out of it for you. It's like, oh damn it, I know what that is. Perfectly safe now. Right? So you'll kind of learn how the magician performs his act. And hopefully, and for a lot of people that helps. Some things like, oh, okay, well, that's not so scary anymore. That seems very simple. So there's full parlor tricks that they do. But that makes this hard because phones don't look scary. Airplanes don't look scary, but I, I admit it. Like it looks scary. Like they and they did it on purpose. So the trickiness of coaster phobia. All right, um, and then this part of this is review, um, and then we're going to get right into mindfulness. Going to shut up and hit play on something that I think might interest you. Three major goals. So let me tell you what I want. What I'm my goals for you as an individual, actually writer or supporter side, um, everyone gets something out of this. One major goal of the Face Your Fear project is to reduce, not eliminate. Keep this in mind. I didn't emphasize this the first couple years, and people were really worried on the way to Cedar Point. One goal is simply to reduce your physiological reaction to anxiety. I don't want to take it away. I can't take it away. But I can help you reduce it. Most people are nervous on the bus ride there. And they tell themselves, like, oh, my God, this didn't work. Oh my, I thought it worked, and it didn't. Oh, my God, I'm pretty, now, I'm, now I'm scared. That's okay. It's actually, that's fine. The second goal is to get you to conquer that avoidance piece. In other words, if you use myself as an example, for years, anxiety yanked me around on a leash. I listened to it. I avoided Magnum. I let it win every single time. One and two are intimately related. Again, let's say your anxiety is a 10. Okay, you're going to avoid it because your anxiety is a 10. But what if we can get it down to a 7? You're still nervous, but it's reduced just enough to get you to not avoid it this time. Does that make sense? So now you're real. All right. Whew, I'm still nervous, but okay, it's, it's 7 out of 10, not a 10 out of 10. So it's not to take it away. Excuse me. It's just to reduce it enough to get you to go on it. And third, also related to change your mind, so we, we mentioned this before, this cognitive restructuring piece. Part of this journey is changing the way you think about the ride, whatever your goal might be. And again, I'm just making this a thing. What's not a goal is not to make take away fear and anxiety from your life. That's just part of being a human. I'm not trying to turn you into emotionless robots. That's not the deal. It's just to really get you to learn how to reduce your own anxiety so that, I mean, obviously, how important is riding a roller coaster in your life? No, but what if you find yourself in a situation four years from now getting ready for a job interview and you feel that same voice in your head, right? All right, well, now you know you have the tools to be able to conquer that. Oh, I forgot this one last piece on phobias. I went to great lengths to find these pictures. Sorry. I don't like it. Yes. Are these the five components? No, so I that's that's kind of review. So what are the five components? We did this last week of the Face Your Fear project. Psychoeducation is number one. We're kind of in the middle of that. Relaxation. Relaxation. We're going to emphasize that more today, but we started that. Cognitive restructuring. We won't even start that for another couple weeks, but that's that is coming down the road. Social support. Social support. Good plug. Exactly. Um, and then finally, exposure. Right. So we will actually take take a trip and finally do that. So what these are, Chloe. So thanks for clarifying. All right. Where does this come from? The, the writers, the face your fear writers, will have their first assignment. This week, we'll talk about it before you get out of here today. And part of that assignment is just contemplating, reflecting, that's all, on 
okay, what's driving this? So you got this, so you, okay, where did your anxiety come from? Well, it turns out there's five different pathways, and this is where the light bulb finally went off for me. Like, okay, I can figure it out. Most people think that phobias come from some type of trauma that you have, which would make sense. I had one girl, um, well, we'll get to that. I'll tell you a story in a second. So what are the five avenues? This also, by the way, is in that reading that's called causes. It could be a childhood, a childhood phobia that never got extinguished. We don't diagnose phobias in five-year-olds and six-year-olds because it's actually normal. Some kids are freaked out by the dark. They have a phobia. Storms. These are actually, so in child psychopathology, we get into this. We don't diagnose kids with phobias because those are actually natural phobias that many kids have. But as you get older, and if you take a child development class, right around the age of seven and eight, something changes. Your brain's developing the ability to distinguish between fantasy and reality, so horror movies don't take on a realistic tone. You don't watch The Exorcist and think it's a documentary like I did when I was six. Right? So you, you had tons of fears that have been extinguished over the years, just naturally. But maybe they didn't for some reason, and that could drive a phobia in adulthood. So childhood fear that wouldn't go away. The second one is what most people think of when they think of phobias. Oh, well, you probably fell out of a roller coaster when you're <laughs> hopefully not. My wife, she knows I tell this story every year. My wife has a phobia of spiders. The reason she has a phobia of spiders is because when she was a tiny person, she got bit by a brown recluse. So that's not a good spider to get bitten by. The black widow, brown recluse. So it kind of makes sense in my head that she has a, a phobia of spiders. The funny thing about it, though, is you get to like, okay, well, that makes sense, Dr. Meyer. Like, shouldn't we all have a phobia of brown recluse? I mean, yeah, you should probably avoid it. Like, I'm not scared of you at all. Let me pet you. No, so let me explain how the, how the phobia goes, though. And I learned this when we were dating. Um, so I was over at her condo, and we were upstairs bedroom and there's a bathroom in there um and she's in the bathroom and i hear this blood curdling scream like someone was attacking her like like holy shit so i run upstairs like what's going on um and she's like and she, she's already out of the bathroom the door is slammed shut she's like there's a spider in the bathroom and i'm like oh and i'm like so we're, remember we're still we're still we're in the courting phase uh, we're not yet engaged um and so of course boyfriend kevin like, aha, I have a moment to become the knight in shining armor and save my girlfriend, who will be my wife one day, uh, from this enormous spider. Right? I thought my, an opportunity to show my bravery and courage as a man. Um, so it's, I'm like, I, I will enter the bathroom, I will slay the spider, and I shall return. <laughs> so she's like, she's like, you need to kill it. Like, and I'm like, all right, like, like, I'll go in. And I'm like, so I'm like, and she's, so she shuts the door. I go in, she shuts the door behind me. Like, like, all right, well, where is this thing? So that's my first goal, to find the spider. I'm like, where is it? I didn't see it. I'm like, oh, shit, it went away. My opportunity is slipping away. Um, but I, I couldn't find it. She's like, it's over there by the toilet. I'm like, like all right. So I'm like, look at it. I'm expecting, you know, like a tarantula. <laughs> no, but I'm expecting like a decent sized like garden spider. Like, okay, that would freak me out too. Um, and I, I literally can't find anything. I'm like, I really don't see it. And she's like, opens the door, says, it's over there. And I'm like, where? And I look, and I look closer, and finally I see it. This, he's got his little lunch box. He's going, he's this tiniest little, this teeny, like literally, ever seen like a tiny spider? And there he is, like, he's lost, looking for his parents. Like, And I'm like, I, I gotta kill you, man. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, and she says, the door is already shut by this, because she wants nothing to do with it. So I'm like, I'm like, all right, I gotta kill you. And she shuts the door. And I look back, and guess what happened? He ran off. <laughs> oh shit! And I said, like, now I can't find him. Um, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, all right, like I probably for two minutes, <laughs> and I'm like, I killed it. And I, I even like rolled up a, a Kleenex. I'm like I killed it. It's it's gone. And the cousin, I'm like, shit, man, we have like this tiny little spider. Like, what the hell are you scared of this thing for? And guess what she said? Show me. 
<laughs> like what? <laughs> show me. I'm like, I'm like, show you what? <laughs> I'm just like, I need to see the body. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so I'm like, so in that moment, I, I learned not to lie to my wife. Um, but I also, I also just, I'm like, I'm like, all right. Like I'm, I'm just gonna come clean. I didn't. He ran away. He's like, you get trapped in the bathroom and don't come back out until you have that spider's body. I want his head on the floor. So no, that's what I felt. So I went back in, um, and I finally I, I found him. At least I think I found him. I, it might have been his dad or his mom. <laughs> um, but I finally, I guess you spend time in the bathroom long enough to find a bug. I, I, I don't know if it was a spider, but I skilled something. I'm like. Oh, I was like, okay, we can continue on. In other words, so my wife has a spider phobia. Um, direct exposure, but it's irrational at this point. It's not just brown recluse, it's also tiny adolescent spiders. Vicarious, this can also happen to you. Most of you weren't alive. I expect none of you were probably alive when 9 11 happened. But you've probably heard of 9 11. It's a terrible thing that happened in our country. I watched it happen on live TV. Heck, I'll never forget. There's one of those moments that are just locked in your brain. Um, I had the day off of work, and I was getting cable installed in my apartment in Rundlesburg, Ohio, which is about a mile away from my wife's condo. But anyway, I so no TV, and this guy, he was from Jamaica. He worked for Time Warner. And he came over, and he plugged my cable in. Like, All right. That's okay. And right when he plugged it in is when it happened. The first plane hit. And he was there. This dude ended up sitting with me for four and a half hours on my couch, and we watched the whole thing unfold. Like, we, I mean, you just couldn't stop watching. You... You just couldn't stop watching the footage and what was happening. Unbelievable, like right in front of your eyes. Lots of people developed airplane phobias that day. They weren't on the planes. They don't know anyone who was on the planes, but because of the horrific things that they were watching, they vicariously developed an airplane phobia and never touched a plane another day in their life. So you can see something. You can hear about something. In fact, this is what drives a lot of people's amusement park anxieties and phobias. Like, well, I heard the lady fell out of that thing. Not really. Number four, another one can be modeling. Parents and or legal guardians can absolutely create, manifest a phobia in their children by the way they act with them. I'm not promoting not monitoring your child, but some parents are way too, no, 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 no. They, they, they teach their child that everything is dangerous and, and unsafe. They never let their kid ride their bike without a suit of armor on. Like, just let them freaking ride the bike. First, <laughs> the arm flips. They can barely move by the time they get on the bike, but they're, they're taught, no, oh, this is dangerous. Where can I go? You can go 100 yards there, and you come right back while I watch. Like, what? They're teaching the. So, parents can model these things. If a parent has a phobia, and the kid learns, like, oh, that's dangerous, they can grow up to be an adult. And then finally, so, so still, for me, none of this is making sense because I never had an accident. I wasn't scared of roller coasters. My parents didn't model it. Why? It wasn't until I read about this one when the light bulb went off for me. It's something that we call channeling. It turns out, you put a little asterisk beside this, it turns out this is actually the most common. Seems to be the most common avenue for phobias to develop. I'm going to give you a definition. I'll write it down. Because we're not... PowerPoint's not up there. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe you've heard this word before, because this isn't exclusive to the world of mental health. Do you want to know what the diathesis is? You all have one. I just don't know what it's about. A diathesis is genetic susceptibility to something. So if both of your parents have high cholesterol. I'm just thinking so. You probably have a diathesis for higher cholesterol. You might have to watch your diet a little more than your roommate. If male pattern baldness runs in your family, 
you have a diathesis, sorry, for male heterodolphins. So that's all it is, diathesis for whatever. You all have one, I just don't know what it is. It turns out, you'll hear more about this story later, it turns out I am I really strong diathesis for anxiety. I'm surrounded by it on all corners of my family. So I've got the genes, whether I like it or not, I've got the genes to potentially develop an anxiety disorder. Thankfully, I don't have any schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depressive disorder in my family, but we are blessed with the anxiety genes. Thanks, Mom, Dan. So I'm more susceptible to this than other people. And some of you in this room, share that with me. Welcome to the club. So this is how channeling works. I didn't know this. No one told me when I was 12, like, well, you know, son, the anxiety genes run strong in the wire family, part of our crest. See that nervous figure? <laughs> Could be. So you've got a diathesis. You may or may not know this, but you've got a diathesis for anxiety. That's step number one in channeling. Step number two is you've got a lot of stuff happening in your life, lots of stress, whether that be family stress, situational stress, but there's lots of stuff going on. If you stop and think about it, there's lots of stuff going on in your life. And then number three, for whatever reason, your anxiety takes the form of a phobia. A lot of times when I talk about this, I'll have a picture of the Death Star from Star Wars. Ever seen the Death Star shoot? It focuses, picks a target, and just there you go. Channeling. There's no rhyme or reason to it, and this is also why phobias can develop about anything. There is no rhyme or reason or rational explanation as to why my anxiety chose Magnum for me to develop a phobia, but I had the diathesis for anxiety. Lots of stuff going on. In other words, my brain was ripe to develop some type of anxiety disorder. And boom, it picked phobia. And it picked magnum. I can't explain why. It just did. Yes? Um, can you say the definition for diathesis? Yeah, it's your genetic susceptibility to, to anything. So if on polio runs in your family. But if a disease runs in your family, you probably have a diathesis for that, unfortunately. I mean, this, you know, I don't know why you always say negative things. If a great sense of humor runs in, runs in your family, you have a diathesis for a great sense of humor. Charm and wit. So this isn't always, it's literally anything. Your, your genes, whatever you're born with. So you got a diathesis, you got stress, and boom, takes a phobia. When we talk about anxiety disorders in chapter six, ooh, you'll realize this is like a, a game show. What are you gonna get? Spin the wheel. Hey, I got OCD. What'd you get? Panic disorder. Oh damn it! <laughs> I wanted that one. No, literally, my, my, my sisters and I were like, pick one. But anyway, more on the Meyer family later. Any questions, Lucas? No? All right, well, we left off. Remember Dan Harris? He started this journey. We're going to pick up where we left off with Dan. Here we go. He, he had just met Tolly. Remember Tolly? I make little spaces. And I never get mad. So I'm going to back it up, just like any good Netflix episode, about 10 seconds, and we'll pick up here. I need to meet this guy. Do you stop thinking? How do you stop the voice in your head? You create little spaces in your daily life where you are aware, but not thinking. For example, you take one conscious breath. Unbreak my heart, Tolly. That's all the practical advice you've got. I can hear the cynics in the audience saying, "Guy saying I can, I can, you know, awaken by taking a deep breath." What is he, what is he talking about? Yes, that's the mind talking. So that's, and of course, many people will have their mind commenting on what I'm saying and saying well, that is useless. That was exactly what my mind was saying. Don't you ever get pissed off, annoyed, irritated, sad, anything negative? No, I, I accept what is, and that's why life has become so simple. Well, somebody cuts you off in, 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 their, in, in your car? It's fine. It's like a sudden gust of wind. I don't personalize a gust of wind or 
and so on. It's simply what is. And you're able to enjoy every moment, even if I start asking you a ton of annoying questions. Yes, that would be fine. So it's really... Don't tap me. <laughs> <laughs> I walked out of the interview deeply confused by Tolly, but still very much intrigued by the notion of defanging the voice in my head. As it happened, just a few weeks later, I was moderating a debate for Nightline, and one of the guests was Deepak Chopra, the inspiration for the movie The Luck Guru. My goal is to get you to say, gee, you are you, TM. I couldn't resist whipping out my little camera to ask if he had any practical advice. So your mind doesn't wander? You don't find yourself thinking about things that are in the past or in the future as opposed to in the present? I have no um, regrets about the past. I do not hold resentments or grievances that come from the past, and I don't anticipate the future. I live in the moment. Okay, so what if the moment is horrible? What if you really have to go to the bathroom and there's no toilet nearby? Or what if you're super hungry and I food? separate myself from the situation surrounding the moment. The moment is always free. It's the transformational vortex to the infinite. Apparently, when one lives in the moment, one becomes unafraid to use terms like transformational vortex to the infinite. With Deepak not making any sense to me, I decided to dive further into America's self-help subculture, where things only got weirder. Do you want to be a millionaire? What kind of a business do you want to have? I met a gaggle of gurus, many of whom featured prominently in the best-selling book and DVD, The Secret. And their advice for dealing with the voice in my head was to force myself to do more positive thinking which they promised could get me anything you want. This is Joe Vitale, who charges five grand for a ride in his Rolls Royce. Well, there are people who think I should charge a lot more than that. They think that's giving it away. And who in this interview, as you're about to see, folds like a cheap lawn chair. So what if I want a thing, um, uh, a diamond necklace for my wife? Can I, I can get that by thinking about it? Not just thinking about it. That's one of the biggest misconceptions of all time. You have to take action. Isn't that a, a statement of the glaringly obvious? Do you think it's news to most people that if you want something, you have to want it and then try to get it? You know, when you put it that way, it sounds silly and, and actually, you know, pretty brainless. After listening to me yammer on about all of this for months, my then fiance, Bianca, who was a doctor, decided to intervene. She started giving me books to read. Books that made me realize that all this stuff about the voice in the head and being in the moment, these are ideas that people have been talking about for centuries. From the Buddha, to Sigmund Freud, to Mother Day Hall, to Coach Taylor from Friday Night Lights. So I suggest you wake up, get your heads in this game. I read tons of these books, stacks of them, and it was through these books that I finally found something that actually does work. It's simple, scientifically tested, and completely free. Problem was, it sounded totally unacceptable to me. Up next, what I found at the end of my long, strange journey. It's the secret to success for everyone from executives to pro athletes, even to Marines. It's been shown to rewire your brain for happiness. How I got there and how you can too when Nightline continues. ago, I found myself on a strange, unplanned journey. It started with an on-air panic attack and led to interviews with a gaggle of gurus, none of whom could give me any practical, actionable advice for taming the voice in my head. Until finally, I stumbled upon the last thing I ever would have expected. Meditation. I always assumed meditation was for people who like crystals, incense, and John Tesh music. In other words, there was no way I was going to meditate. But then I heard about scientific studies showing that meditation can, among other things, lower your blood pressure and boost your immune system. And then I learned that meditation does not necessarily involve wearing robes, lighting incense, or believing in anything. In so, fun little fact, and I actually tried this as an experiment. Um, I got a really cool PA, physician's assistant. She actually is our family doctor, Lauren Regal, highly recommend. Uh, but anyway, she's over at Altman, and uh, they took my blood pressure once. So that there was lots of crap. I, they always take blood pressure at the wrong time. I wasn't. I, I wasn't. Right. I was. There's so much stuff that happened that morning. My blood pressure was 140 over something, which is like danger zone. In fact, there's a sign on their door that says, 
if blood pressure is over 140 over 90, you must call the insurance company. I'm like, oh shit, like I'm gonna have a heart attack. But no, she knew she, there, there was stuff going on that morning. I'm like, I'm just really keyed up and that's why the blood pressure is up. Um, and so she left the room. She's like, all right, so she was gonna do something, you know about you, they come and go. But I've been doing this now for, for how many years? So I, in that time she left, I'm, like, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try something. Cause they said they were gonna redo the blood pressure. And so I took that five minutes and I started doing mindful meditation for five straight minutes, just while she was out of the room. She came back and my blood pressure was 117 over 20. Like in five minutes, it took it from hypertension, like you're gonna die of a heart attack, which is what happens to a lot of people. They're hypertensive for years, right? And this like, high blood pressure. So in that five minutes, I didn't go, I didn't go like this at all, by the way. Um, I, just, I just sat there and I did this, what you're gonna learn from him, and it went down just like that, 117 over 20. And she's like, what the hell did you do? I'm like, I just did some meditation for five minutes and it lowered my blood pressure to a place where they could actually let me leave and not <laughs> put me into the hospital for a week. In particular, people of any faith or no faith can do it. In fact, it's totally straightforward. There are basically just three steps. Number one, sit upright. It doesn't have to be cross-legged. You can do it in a chair, on the floor, whatever. Two, just try to feel your breath coming in and going out. And three, whenever your mind wanders, which it will a million times, simply return your attention to the breath. So one day after I learned all of this, I very reluctantly gave it a shot. Breathe in. What kind of bird with Big Bird? Breathe out. Do I need a haircut? What's the trouble? I decided to like that be yellow. In a way, it was like a panic attack. My mind hurling lots of crazy thoughts at me. Idea for old school hip hop vegetable. Rap Van Winkle. Why? But this time, I had a weapon. Get in the game, dude. In those in. brief moments where I was simply out. focused on my breath, breathe in, breathe out. It was like breathe pressing in. the mute button on the voice in my out. head. Where did breathe gerbils in. run wild? Breathe out. I described out. myself as more of a breathe in or a shot. Breathe out. And it created space in. between the thoughts out. before they inevitably came marauding back in. Meditation is like exercise for your brain. I'm not speaking metaphorically here. Check this out. Brain scans show that short daily doses of meditation literally grow the gray matter in areas associated with self-awareness and compassion and shrink the area associated with stress. As for me, it's not like my life has become a non-stop parade of rainbows and unicorns. I still sometimes let work stress me out and distract me, but my emotions and impulses no longer yank me around as much, which frankly is a superpower. Meditation has also helped me slow down enough that the good stuff in my life has become much more vivid. From the fact that ABC lets me be the co-anchor of Nightline to simply eating cookies with my wife or playing with our cats. An important point here, it is possible to get happier in this way without going soft. These Marines here are part of an experiment to see if meditation makes more resilient warriors. The first time they said to you, we're going to teach you how to meditate, what was your gut reaction? Oh, this is going to be absolutely ridiculous. Corporate executives are using it too. Even the lead singer of Weezer, who told me meditation helped him cure crippling stage fright. That's about eight, eight years ago. I started practicing two hours every day, and uh, at first, you don't have to do two hours a day. But actually, the the unpleasantness got worse before I was going on stage, and I was wondering, is is this really working? But I stuck with it. And now I feel so much calmer. And check out this list of other conditions meditation has been shown to be good for. There are no miracle cures, despite what you hear from the self-help gurus. I like to say meditation has made me roughly 10% happier. If it can work for a fidgety, skeptical newsman, maybe you too should give it a shot. Maybe. And maybe you're not quite convinced just yet. So um, <clears throat> one thing to write down before we hit play on something else that we'll, we'll get part way through. Let me see where we're at here. Let's skip to this one. So yeah, Tolley was actually right. He wasn't just pulling those words out of nowhere. What mindful meditation teaches you to do is to literally make spaces in your, I guess let's put it this way, your stream of consciousness, what's going on for you.
I think I asked you this last week, but how many of you have been with someone or you're that someone when you look down, they're, they're on their phone, they're talking to you and they're right. That's like happens to everybody countless times a day or even worse, you're in your car and you find yourself on your phone or you look over at the person driving the semi beside you and they're on their phone. I'm sure this has happened to all of you and some of you have probably been in pretty close calls because of this for various reasons. What's that all about? You're not focused, right? Think of athletes, musicians, artists, whatever it is, lots of problems are caused by not being where you are in the present moment. I'll never forget playing Little League Baseball, <laughs> played for the Orioles. We had our, our outfits were green. Anyway, I played in the outfield, and I remember once I got hit in the head with a ball because I wasn't paying attention. I was like in my own little world, staring down at the grass, bored, and the person had hit the ball, and it was coming towards me. And people were even screaming, like, Kevin, catch it! I literally got hit in the head because I wasn't focused. I'm not there. And that's what this is all about. Your brain's natural state, whether you know this or maybe you know this or not, your brain's natural state, a human brain, is actually to wander. It either wanders into the future or it wanders into the past. In fact, there's a name for this. It's also known as your monkey brain. I'm not sure where it came, people came up with that. But human brains are wired with something called the default mode network. The EMN. And the default mode network kicks in when you are idle. Right now you have something to do. How many of you feel like you get, feel like you get a little bit anxious or worked up when you have nothing to do? Like you always, I need something to do, something to occupy my mind. Right, a lot of people. The default mode network kicks in, and, it, and this isn't just you or people with anxiety. This is a human being. A human being's default mode network kicks in when you're just sitting. Maybe you're trying to go to sleep. Maybe you're just relaxing, doing nothing, right? We actually start to see this specific network start to light up. When this lights up, guess what's happening? You're starting to think about the future or the past. But what that means is you're not in the present moment. Now let's say you don't have any anxiety at all, and you're like this roller coaster stuff, whatever. I just, I just, I'm just here for the ride to Cedar Point. Most people can at least relate to this, right? I, I would like my mind to not wander so much. Maybe I would like to, I'd like to be less distracted in my life. Okay. Well, guess what? This mindful meditation stuff also works for people with focus problems and attention issues. And I'm not saying you have ADHD, but who wouldn't want to focus better? My God, sign me up. Like I joked, I wasn't kidding. I have the attention span of a six month old old retriever, which is just like, damn, it's out. I just can't, <laughs> it hasn't changed. I'm 45 and it's still the same way, but this helps you focus. So your brain's natural state is to just wander off into la la land. In fact, don't feel bad if it happens to you. Even people who have been meditating for decades, so I guess we'd call them master meditators, it takes on average four to six seconds for them to start feeling what we call it just intrusive thoughts. In other words, random, where does this come from? Why am I thinking about Big Bird? Why am I thinking about a campfire? Like what? So not even things that you have to do, like just random, right? This pops in your head. Well, that's your default mode network kicking in. Like, okay. So intrusive thoughts are going to happen when you meditate. It's used. This idea of mm, clear your mind, yes. even though this is all Star Wars, it's connected to everything. Some of you already know this. But this idea of having a clear mind is actually a myth. That's a lie. Mm, yes, nothing. No, it's going to happen. But that's actually a good thing. So intrusive thoughts, in a way, you actually want them to happen because this is when the magic happens. So when you get an intrusive thought, whatever it is, and I don't mean negative by intrusive, I just mean thought, when something crosses your mind. One, it's very important when you do this to have a non-judgmental attitude. What I mean by that is don't beat yourself up for having an intrusive thought. It's just a thought, and it happens to everyone. It happens to the Dalai Lama when he's on the mountain with a goat meditating. 
It happens to Hem too. So sure, it's going to happen to Mark from Baden. It's okay. So have a nod. Don't be another. So if a thought comes, just accept it. Oh, hello, thought. Hello, there you are. And the second, just remind yourself, okay, that was a thought. I need to refocus on my breath. It's all it takes. Not everyone does this, but I, you can probably tell I have a kind of a cartoony brain. <laughs> I always visualize, I don't know why it's the color blue. It just is. I always visualize my breathing as something blue coming in and then going out. That's always helped me focus. People usually come up with their own tricks, but it's not the, just tell yourself, just, okay, go back to focusing on the breath. And then maybe two seconds later, another thought comes, you have to repeat the process. But here's the reason I wrote the change. Here's the beauty of this. We keep talking about the amygdala, right? Prefrontal cortex. We've discovered that when you return to the breath, that's when this change happens. That's the exercise. That's the bicep curl. So in a way, if you meditate for five minutes and you get 38 intrusive thoughts and you've returned to your breath 38 straight times, you've done 38 reps. Think of it that way. If you didn't get intrusive thoughts, you'd never get a chance to, to actually do the exercise. You would, well, damn it. I want to, but I can't. Does this make sense? So the change happens when you return yourself to the breath. Even if it's only successful for one and a half seconds, you did a rep. And it gets easier. That I do it the first time I so now we're going beyond just breathing. When you threw this in, this is when it got really weird for me when I first started. The, who can't breathe? But it gets a little bit easier and a little bit easier as you try it. And since he mentioned it there, the last this will be the last bit of notes to write down for today. Then we'll watch 10 minutes of something, and then half of you will get out of it. He mentioned that Weezer guy, two hours, holy Lord. No one, no one has that. I don't have that. You don't, I mean, maybe you do. But hopefully some days you don't have that. When they first started researching uh, this stuff, like, right? So, and then back, they actually used monks. So those were the first people of the university. The, I, know, I knew it was going to happen. Uh, the University of Wisconsin, they actually brought in monks to study their brains because they knew that they were calm, collected, they live longer. Um, and they were really curious. All right, so you meditate. How long, that's a good question to ask. How long do you have to meditate to actually see the positive change? Because if it's like six hours, Sorry, but who's going to, we don't, not everyone can be a monk. I'm sorry, it's not part of my job. So they started to study this, and they started off with two hours, actually. That was the initial study, and they found all these positive changes. Okay, great, but who has two hours? Let's, let's try just an hour. And when I say an hour, an hour a day for eight weeks. That's what they study in these people. Hour a day, oh my God, guess what? The hour a day people had the same change as two hours. Hmm, less time. Then they went to a half hour. Guess what they found? Same exact change. They got it down to five to ten minutes. That's, that's the beauty of this. If you just practice mindful meditation for five to ten minutes a day, you get the same benefit as someone who's doing it for eight hours. I'm not saying they're wasting their time, because some people just really like it. But isn't that great? I mean, this is actually the good news. What if I told you to train for a marathon, it turns out you don't have to run 20 miles, you just have to run one. Same benefit. Sign me up. All right. This is great. I'm done. <laughs> Two push-ups. Yes. <laughs> so this is actually really good news. So five to ten minutes a day. But the key, and I'm going to emphasize this again and again, the key is consistency. Consistency, consistency, just like running. It's a good analogy, actually. If you are interested in training for a marathon, let's say you... 10 days, you're at it. All right, 10 days. And then the 11th day, you're like, ah, and you take five days off. Uh, probably not so good. So you got to be consistent. But the good thing is it's not a big time investment. It's five to 10 minutes a day. Now, the bad news. Here's the bad news. The good news is the time commitment's not that great. The bad news, and I, to me, it's, I just think I should preface it that way, is it does take time for people to see a change. 
It doesn't happen overnight. It won't happen in a week. It won't happen in two weeks. For most people, the first detectable signs of things changing for them is around three to four weeks. That's when students first start to say, huh, I am sleeping better. I'm not such an irritable asshole. Studying feels a little bit easier. I'm able to focus better. It takes time, though. And that's what most people don't like to hear, because we all just want the pill that's going to make us, just give me the quick fix. This is not a quick fix. However, it's meaningful change, and that's kind of the selling point. And that's why airplane phobia guy was finally in the office to actually change something, because he had just been using Xanax and other stuff, right? You can take things to mask symptoms of things, or you can do some work behind the scenes to actually change what's actually happening so that you don't have to do that. Nothing wrong with taking medication to help you get through something, but you're not supposed to be on it forever. You're not supposed to be on antidepressants from now until you're 88. Right? You're supposed to do something to change your brain, then get off of that stuff. Does that make sense? Okay. So I got this out of the way. A little bit of this. I guess we didn't have time to start chapter three, but who wants to do that anyway? We will on Thursday. When Yongi Mingyur Rinpoche was a child living in Nepal, in the shadow of Mount Monoslu, he had terrible panic attacks. I have a lot of fear about the snowstorm when the thunder comes, and I fear for strangers. One day my father said, oh, you want to learn meditation, right? The first meditation thing is he asked me to watch my breath, so I watch my breath. That's a common mindfulness exercise. And soon, Mingyur was a mindfulness meditation prodigy. Decades later, he built this monastery in Bodh Gaya, India, the place where the Buddha famously achieved enlightenment while meditating under a tree. He spent four years wandering the Himalayas, practicing mindfulness and growing a beard. And then, scientists invited him to Wisconsin so they could look at his brain. They found that although he was 41, he had the brain of a 33-year-old. When they had him go in an fMRI machine and cultivate a sense of compassion by meditating, the activity in his empathy circuits shot up seven to 800%. One of the researchers later wrote, such an extreme increase befuddles science. The closest resemblance is in epileptic seizures, but brains are seized by seizures in contrast to Mingyur's intentional control of his brain activity. Ningyur Rinpoche had somehow induced a prolonged attack of compassion in his own brain. When the research... So think about what they just tossed at you there. Really, if you peel back all the layers, a reaction to anxiety and fear is happening inside your brain, right? And, but it feels out of control. How can I possibly control this? Well, they just gave you a big clue. What he's able to do, he, he controls... His brain, he's in charge, not the other way around. When researchers studied the brain waves of a whole group of long-term meditators, they found similar results. The moment meditation began, there was a sudden rush of activity. Meditation causes big changes in the minds of experts. But when beginners meditate, not much happens. These observations seem to back up a long-held claim that meditation can make you a master of your own mind. Early Buddhist texts say this can help end suffering. Modern headlines are a bit more clinical, claiming mindfulness may cure anxiety, depression, and a whole host of other health problems. So what is real and what is hype? How can the simple practice of watching your own breath change the way your brain works? And can that change your life? Bring your full attention to the in-body and out in breath. Expansion of in breath. Simply notice your breathing in. Contraction of the out breath. Releasing of attention. Now withdraw your attention from the external things and relax. There's many, many different styles of meditation. Literally hundreds of different forms of meditation. The word meditation, you can liken to sports. There are many different kinds of sports. There are many different kinds of meditation. 
And strictly speaking, most of them are not mindfulness. There's transcendental meditation, which the Beatles got into while writing the White Album. The idea here is to repeat a mantra, a word or sound, until you transcend thought entirely. Then there's dynamic meditation, which is supposed to break old thought patterns. You may recognize it from coverage of the Rajneesh Purim community. Most religions have some kind of practice that could be called meditation, quietly contemplating scripture or forms of ritual prayer intended to bring you closer to God. Some of the oldest forms of meditation come from early Hinduism. According to tradition, around 500 BC, the Buddha studied these techniques, but then he added his own spin. He systematically developed a new meditation technique that is called the Satipatthana meditation. This is the traditional form of mindfulness meditation, one step on the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment that the Buddha taught his followers. The goal isn't to get closer to the divine or to empty your mind. It's to pay attention. Sati means attention. Upa means inside. And Tana means to keep. Satipatthana simply means to keep your attention inside. <laughs> Most of the time, most people actually don't know what their minds are doing. We're pulled by all kinds of forces around us, and we do stuff that we're just not aware of. Things happen, and we react. And so part of the practice of mindfulness is bringing awareness to what it is that our minds are actually doing. To explain this technique, Buddha told a story. One day, Mr. Turtle and Mr. Fox met in the forest. Mr. Fox thought, I'm going to have a good food today. And Mr. Turtle thought, Oh my goodness, my enemy is out there. Shall I run? I'm not fast enough. So he went inside his shell. Mr. Fox paced round and round Mr. Turtle, but eventually he got tired of waiting and went away. Every time you see a real fox in your life, like stress, tension, depression, anxiety, sadness, worries, you should be like Mr. Turtle. That doesn't mean running away from your problems. It means observing your reaction to those problems instead of engaging with them, appreciating that these feelings are passing products of your own mind, and you can control your relationship to them. You can make friends with the other emotion, a difficult situation in our life. You can need fight. You don't need to surrender for the problem. Make friends. You can bring this quality to anything. Whatever we do throughout the day, it has to be done with mindfulness. According to one text, the Buddha told his followers to be aware of their minds and bodies while looking around. Eating, drinking, chewing, tasting, walking, standing, sitting, even when obeying the calls of nature. Mindfulness meditation is just a way to practice this skill. Slowly, slowly, train our mind, like going to gym. When you go to the gym and you do exercise, develop your muscle, you become more fit. So mind become more healthy and, and develop. You can think of a mindfulness session as a training ground. Every Tuesday evening at six o'clock at the Moran Medium Security Prison, a group of inmates gather in room eight. Mindful of this moment, I feel as light and free as the clear blue sky, awakening here now in room eight, I smile. I was definitely skeptical about it. You can tell me that meditation by breathing, that is going to help you. Breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. Then within a few seconds, your mind will begin to wander. Our teacher said that's the nature of the mind at the beginning. At the beginning, I just felt like my mind is just racing a million miles an hour. When your mind wanders like this, it's usually time traveling. I'm thinking about what happened in the past. Or I'm thinking about the future. And we can see that activity in brain scans, lighting up something called the default mode network, or DMN. It's what allows us to call up memories or imagine the future, but it also lets us endlessly ruminate about regrets and fears. It's what some Buddhists call the monkey mind. If your mind goes out a million times, be mindful and kind enough to bring it back to the present moment a million times. You can uh, tame the monkey mind. <laughs> that 
noticing of distraction, of noticing that your mind is lost, is so important because um, it's a moment of awakening. In that moment, when you direct your attention back to your breath, a part of the brain lights up, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It's one of those brain regions that sets us primates apart from other animals, part of the control center that helps us focus. Meditation strengthens its connection to the DMN, and in brain scans of expert meditators, their DMNs are less active. This could be the mental muscle that meditation sessions develop. We are simply practicing the quality of paying attention over and over again. Good place to hit the pause button. So I will do that. I actually have something here to pass out. Um, so if you're one of the supporters, let me actually end this. There we go. I'm going to pass this out and then be on your merry way. If you're someone that I think as a writer, sorry, um, stick around for five minutes. Um, I just have a couple things to go over. What this is, is the first of many that you will get. In fact, every Tuesday I will pass one of these out to you. Um, So here's your challenge. And you don't even need to start off with five or ten minutes a day. Um, however, that'd be awesome. Um, you can even do more. You can do multiple times a day. This is just a simple breathing log. Same thing I literally, I give this to my clients too. All I'd like you to do is fill it out. It's pretty simple. Just how, when you did it, how long you did it for. If you happen to need another one before next Tuesday, let me know. Maybe you're just filling it up. And if you bring this back on Tuesday, you will get a extra point, a bonus point, for every single one of these that you turn back in every Tuesday. Did you get one? So every time you turn one of these in, I'll give you a bonus point, which might not sound like a lot. That might sound like, well, that's okay, one point. Yay. <laughs> However, let's say we are 15 weeks into the semester and you turn 15 of these in, you just turn the 75 into a 90 from one exam. So just keep that in mind. It's not nothing if it builds up. I get it, it's tiny. Is the next one? There you go. So give it a shot. Remember the target is five to 10 minutes a day, but maybe just a minute is where you need to start. Perfectly fine. Then start with a minute. So don't torture yourself, um, but just try to find a quiet place. Um, doesn't matter where it is. Can you do it with someone else? Of course you can. Um, but that's all you need. You need a quiet place. Uh, people always ask about music. We've actually researched this. So music with words? No. Absolutely. No, sorry. No, no not going to work. Um, however, instrumental music, especially music that's you know, kind of calming, is perfectly fine. Um, but music with lyrics doesn't work. In fact, people, you could meditate for eight hours with that and see no effect whatsoever. So there's something about that that changes this. So, um, so that's your challenge. So if you're a supporter, you may leave. If you're one of the writers, just stick around. Not as quite as long as I thought, but that's okay. I just need to go over a few things. Well, and now we see who's left, right? Oh, what do you guys think about all this, by the way? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Someone's left. We'll figure out who that is. Any thoughts? Yeah, I'm something going through your it's interesting. I'm curious to see what happens. Me too. I always, I always am, and I, I've stopped, I've stopped assuming. Um, I don't. There's always someone that ends up doing something that completely blows me away, and I, frankly, blows themselves away. So um, I always try to get some alumni to come in and talk to you guys, like alumni of the project, um, especially people who started off on day one thinking like this is the most no, which is no. <laughs> I mean, I'll sit here, but I'm not going to do it. Um, one lady specifically, she's come back multiple times. She's a nurse, though, at Cleveland Clinic. I'm not sure if she'll be able to make it. But 
Um, she was a, a mom, actually, of two. She was taking my abnormal psych class. And the reason she took the class is because her kids love roller coasters. She, they loved them. And she could never get on them with them. And she was tired of not being able to enjoy this thing that they loved with them. She was always on the sidelines, so she took the class. Never rode a roller coaster in her life. Was absolutely petrified on day one. And she took the course. Uh, well, Cedar Point, she had a goal. She had, and that's kind of what I'm talking to you about right now. Um, she had a really moderate goal. In fact, I think her goal was to get on the Gemini, which is, you know, it's not nothing. Um, but it's not one of the bigger ones. And she did it. She rode the Gemini. And she said, it's like, it's like almost like a door just opened. Like once she conquered that, she realized, like, oh, my God, wait a second. I've never had anyone in this project turn into a nutball so quickly. She led her group to every single role. She wouldn't stop. It was time to leave. We had to like drag her off of this. It was like she wanted to get in line to ride like this one called the Raptor. Like she was like, she's like, I need to ride this one more time. She literally turned into a donkey like that day. I mean, that doesn't happen to everyone. I don't expect like, oh my God. Um, but it happened to her. And now she's tied up. Like she came in, she told, I, and this was not part of the script. Three years ago, before COVID, the class class before that crap, I had her come in, um, and then halfway through her little talk, she just described what I just described. And she's like, and guess what I just did last week? I'm like, what? She's like, I went skydiving. I'm like, what? Like, she would never, so that's actually our goal in the script. No, we're not here. I'm sorry. Um, so, pretty simple. I was going to do something a little bit different, but I'm going to try something unique with you guys. So, um, you all filled this out, right? Um, do you need this back? Does anyone need it back to kind of look look over, or do you have an idea of what you wrote down? Maybe, maybe not. If you want it back, let me know, because um, I've got them right here. Do you have your first assignment, and that's right up here. It's not like a research paper. If you're wondering, like, what am I getting myself into work-wise, you'll be okay. I, in fact, I think you'll find most of these assignments different and interesting, like some, something you would never do I guess, in another class. So face your fear, the writer assignments. And don't worry, the supporters also have their own stuff that they'll have to do as we go. Um, these are things you can't see yet, and you can't look ahead. This is it. It's called Origins and Goals. This is the first one that everyone's always done in this project, um, wordy. So the first just describes, you got those readings up there, causes. Um, forget the recovery basics. I actually, I'm changing things up a little bit. Um, Basically, uh, all I want you to do, and maybe after you read through those, and I gave you an example of what I went through, I want you to just come up with, the, in the best way that you can explain it, where do you think your own personal anxiety comes from? I've, I've told you my story already three or four times by now. Where do you think it comes from? Like, what's, what's the roots of it? Where does it emanate from? Um, and again, you don't need to share anything you don't feel comfortable sharing. Sorry. So if there's some kind of like, right, I, this is not therapy. Um, so if there's something you don't feel comfortable sharing, you don't even need to tell me. You can just, right, just share if you feel like sharing. Maybe something will, after you read, there's more to those readings than what we shared in class. Maybe a light bulb will go off that you've never thought of before. So just go through those readings. Um, try to come up with an explanation of where you think yours comes from. Mine's definitely channeling. And I, every time I teach this, I think about it a little bit more. Um, with stuff that was going on in my own family, my amygdala. Now it's like a complete nerd. <laughs> my amygdala had to be humming, like, all the time as a little kid. And I never really thought about this way before, but if you're under stress, your amygdala is working. That's just how this stuff works. So it really shouldn't be a shock that by age six or seven, my amygdala was probably big enough and strong enough to induce this kind of stuff. So that's, that's what we meant by this channeling idea. For some of you, maybe it is simpler. Maybe it is like a, I, I had a traumatic experience on a roller coaster. I had a girl once in this class, actually it was picture fear three, not the one twelve. Um, her parents lied to her. She was scared of roller coasters, like they were in Disney World. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Disney World, but there's this roller coaster there called Space Mountain. Um, it's I mean it's tiny. Really, if you look at it, it's tiny, but you can't see it's in the dark. It's completely in the dark, which would freak me out if I was a kid. Well, her parents lied to her. They they thought they could help her conquer her phobia of roller coasters by just putting her on this ride. And they told her, oh no, this isn't a roller coaster, it's a slow, you know like the slow rides at Disney, like, they told her that's what it was. And so she gets out of the car, and of course, nightmare, right? And it made it worse. She never rode a roller coaster since then. That one time, she was eight years old. And she, and she vowed, because she was freaked out. So yeah, you shouldn't, don't try this at home. Um, so 
origins, but also actually this is good. I have I have the website there. What I want you guys to do is come up with your goal. What maybe it's more than one thing. For some of you, it's really specific because it was like one thing, right? That damn swing. Yeah. Um, which is which is fun. So um, there's actually a group of you for which that's all maybe it probably is. So we'll work together on that. Um, so just try to come up with your own goal. Um, and it says by Thursday, but I don't know why it says by Thursday. I'm not sure if I assigned this at a different time last year, um, but just sometime this week. I don't care when it is. It can be Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday. So there's a Dropbox for it. Again, this isn't. A re I, I wouldn't expect more than three fourths of eight. This this isn't like a long thing. Although, if you feel like writing three or four pages, I'll read that too. Um, so there is no magic link. It's just going through the motions. Does this make sense? Awesome. Well, thank you. By the way, this is voluntary. No one has to do this. Um, but this will be fun. There's there's someone. I, I'm not sure who it is. I'll figure it out. There's someone who's not here. But I knew that coming in. It's not a normal here today. But... All right. If you have any any questions at all along the way, just let me know. So, happy now. I've been on this journey myself. And I have a message from the mechanic that I now need to listen to. So, <laughs> Good luck. yeah. <laughs>